Welcome back to Mentor Nation, the podcast for entrepreneurs looking for real mentorship, real strategies, and real stories so that you can go out and build your dreams. I'm your host, John Abbas, and it's time for another episode, so buckle your seatbelt and let's go. Hello, friends from all over, and welcome to another episode of the Mentor Nation podcast. Today's interview is one of the most amazing conversations and by far the most valuable lessons I have ever learned when it comes to marketing. And there is nobody better to give you that lesson today than Mr. Jesse Cole. Jesse is an author. He is the owner of Fans First Entertainment, which, among other businesses, owns the Savannah Bananas baseball team. Now, this team has a very, very special story. When Jesse took over a few years ago, it really was a sad reality. They had less than 200 attendees at their games out of 4,000 available seats. They had one season ticket holder. And really just little to no hope for recovery. But through Jesse's creative marketing, his out-of-the-box thinking, and something he coins an attention plan, he was able to do what nobody thought possible. Sell out every seat at every game, every single year with a multi-year waiting list. You can find Jesse at every single one of those games wearing his iconic yellow tuxedo, putting on a show that will make you a raving fan before the night is over. And today, we dive into the incredible story just about how this happened, but more importantly, how every one of you listening can just have a completely different view on how to approach your own marketing for yourself or for your business, or more importantly, how to create massive attention in order to skyrocket your results in anything that you are doing or building. I really hope you enjoy the episode. And and before we dive in, I just want to ask you to please take a minute and leave us a five-star review if you enjoyed this episode. And if you really want to make an impact, please share this episode and the podcast with anyone that you think might get value. It means a lot. Now for the show. All right, Jesse, thank you so much for being on Mentor Nation and welcome to the show. I am fired up to be with you today and have some fun. Oh, me too. And so I wanted to start off just by asking you because I've been following you for some time and you're traveling all the time. You're meeting really cool people. You're a guest on a ton of really cool podcasts. And so I just want to ask, could you tell us really quick, like a really cool or powerful experience that you've had recently with maybe somebody that you've met or something that you've done that was just like super cool? Well, I I just got back from Customer Service Revolution and I was speaker there and that event is run by the DeJulius Group. And, you know, they live their brand. And as far as customer experience, just to give you an example, a week before I even arrived as to be one of the speakers, I get a gift package from them. And what it includes is a P.T. Barnum book, which I love P.T. Barnum. For the listeners that don't know, I'm in a yellow tuxedo all the time. And with the Savannah (laughs) Banana, we're all about putting on a show. So it's a P.T. Barnum book that I didn't have. Also in the package was a banana phone, which was really, really cool. And then a kid's banana phone for my one-year-old. And just that experience right there about giving gifts that actually care, that you know, they care about us, not just me, but my family. They know what matters most. That's before I even attended the event. And then I get there and I go up into my room and there are even more gifts and packages, you know, that they know exactly what my favorite drinks were, what my favorite snacks were. And all of that is sitting in my hotel room before I'm even at the event. And then when I come down the event, they have a red carpet lineup. And John, you know, the founder of the Jewish group comes over, gives me a big hug and greets me. And it's just, you know, those little touch points made a huge impact. And I think brands that not only talk about what they believe in, but they live it, those are the ones that really make the biggest difference in people's lives. And I was so fortunate and, and appreciative to be able to, you know, speak on that stage. And but more than anything, it was just how that group made me feel. And I think wow. that's how you deliver a great experience. And I'm a huge fan of what they're doing. And I will be speaking their praises wherever I go. Man, that's incredible. So I'm super excited to get into this. And, you know, for the audience, I want them to know that, you know, the big thing that we're going to talk about today is just how to dominate by really differentiating yourself. And there's just, there's not another person in the world 
that exemplifies that more than you do. And I have literally so many questions that I want to ask you, but I wanted to start just by getting into your journey just a little bit. You know, I, I've, I've heard parts of it on other podcasts, but I just wanted to start with, you know, how you got started in baseball and how that has led you to, to where you're at right now. Sure, of course. Only child. I grew up in south of Boston. Uh, my father, my parents were divorced, and my father ended up buying a baseball facility, indoor baseball facility, because he knew how much I loved the game. As like I was six years old, eight years old, I couldn't put a bat down, I couldn't put a ball down. And my father left his previous job and bought into a baseball facility just to take care of me. And so I was a kid going to the, the, the baseball club all the time, playing every day, and was fortunate enough to get offers, college scholarship offers. And I knew not playing in Massachusetts was not where I wanted to play because of the cold weather. So I went down <laughs> south and uh, traveled to Wofford College, a small Division One school, and with the hopes of playing professionally. That was it. That was everything for me. And in my junior year, I ended up tearing everything in my shoulder, my labrum, my rotator cuff. It was the best thing that ever happened to me because that actually ended my career. That ended my chances of playing professionally, but it opened up other doors. And right. at that point, I said, why don't I look into coaching? And I tried coaching, and I realized something very eye-opening there that changed everything. It was, I loved playing the game, but I didn't like watching the game as much. And I thought, hmm. well, how can someone that played their whole life, 20 years, just everything, it was everything for me, but I couldn't enjoy watching it. Why couldn't I make the game fun for people to actually watch it? And so I took an internship with the team and said, what can we do to make the game more fun and more exciting? And I was fortunate. I was successful with that and got offered the job as a general manager at 23 years old of the worst performing team <laughs> in the country. And that was in a little town called Gastonia, North Carolina. And I learned everything there. I just was a fortunate to go to a team that no one was coming to the games. There was only $268 in the bank account on my first day. And I had an owner who gave me the opportunity to try a bunch of different things. And I, that's the biggest thing I learned. It was like, I had the opportunity to experiment and to figure out really what business we're in and not really what business everyone else thinks we're in. Because I learned right away, we're, we weren't in the baseball business, we were in the entertainment business. And so that's when I got to experiment. And, you know, that's where it all changed. I learned a lot there, 10 years. I ended up buying that team, recently sold that team and came to Savannah and started over. And you know, as you know, it's where it got really even more challenging was sleeping on an air bed and had to sell our house and empty out our savings account. But then I learned we had to differentiate ourselves even more. And, so it's been a constant journey of experimenting, trying new things, and you're right, differentiating, because that's that what we learned. That's the game. It's how, do you, how are you different? How do you get people talking about you? And we've been able to have some luck and been able to do that. Man, that, is, that really is incredible, and I, I'm excited to dive more into some of the specifics that you have done, because I think the audience is going to get an absolute kick out of it. So when you had the opportunity when you were 23 to start, you know, just implementing things, you had the ability to, to be creative, you know, what were some of the first few things that you tried and, you know, did they work? Did they not work? Did it take a lot of testing and time? I just want to kind of dive into that, those initial, like, what were the first few things that you were like, you know what, let's try this. Sure. It the first thing we said is we need to have our players a part of the show. So I thought, could we have our players do choreographed dances during the games? And so I remember vividly our first practice before I let them go on the field, I brought a, a dance instructor to actually teach dance lessons to these college baseball players <laughs> on how to dance. And the guys were like, what are you talking about? We're not doing this. We had some guys just walk away and say, I'm not doing it. And so, but eventually what happened is the guys that were dancing were the most popular. The fans were loving them. I remember walking through the crowd one night and a woman, her husband was talking to her, to her and, and the wife hit him on the side of the arm and said, shut up, honey. They're about to dance. And like, it became a thing watching the players dance. But we looked at everything. We, you know, we tried donut burgers and where we put, you know, burgers inside donuts and donut dogs where we actually got donut shaped like an eclair and put a, a hot dog in the middle. Grandma beauty pageants, flatulence fun nights, you know, <laughs> salute to underwear nights. We once even buried a trip to China, a certificate for a trip to China in infield dirt. We called it dig to China night. And we let fans <laughs> go on the field and dig for the chance to win this trip to China. And I'll never forget when the woman dug all the way down and she got the certificate, she looked at it and it was just a one-way flight to China. There was no flight back and no accommodations. <laughs> so we were getting her to China. We just weren't getting her back. So, <laughs> so, but again, some of those created some buzz. Some of those didn't work. Some did work. But the reality is we started building a brand of 
you never know what's going to happen when you come to the ballpark. And I think the biggest aha moment was this concept of you won't believe. You wouldn't believe when I went to the ballpark and this is what I saw. And that is a framework now that we use with every business we work with and say, hey, what are your, your wouldn't believe statements? You wouldn't believe that I went to this daycare and this is what happened. You wouldn't right. believe I worked with this realtor and this is what she did. You wouldn't believe I went to this restaurant and this is what happened. And when you create those, you create marketers, customers that are doing all the marketing for you and then they become raving fans. And so that's, it was just a constant test, 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 experiment, experiment, experiment. And uh, we built our brand that way. Wow. So you obviously, when you took over, you're 23 years old and you were with Gastonia for 10 years. Is that right? Yes. I think 10 or 11 years. Okay. And then did you, like, what made you choose to go to Savannah and, you know, join with the Savannah Bananas? I, I believe things happen for a reason. So it was the final game of the 2014 season. And my wife and I, who we met in, at our field in Gastonia, she was in the industry. She wasn't my wife at that point. Mm. And we had a final game and I decided to propose in front of a sold out crowd. And I was in the yellow tuxedo and I stopped the game and put the ring inside of baseball and went down to a knee in the middle of the game and opened up the baseball, had the ring. And I don't think she ever said yes, but she ran over and hugged me and there were fireworks going off in the stadium. At that point, I think she did commit to me to get married. And what happened is the next day she said, I can't believe you did this. So, you know, let's do something fun next weekend. And so she planned a trip to Savannah, Georgia. And we can't, went to Savannah, Georgia, never been to Savannah before, fell in love with the city and went to the minor league baseball park, uh, Grayson Stadium. And there had been professional baseball there for 90 years. And there was a, wow. a team in the New York Mets affiliate playing there. And we walked in and I felt like a kid in a candy store. You ever walk in somewhere and just like, just like look around at every single piece. I mean, I was looking, it was old bricks from, you know, it was built in 1926, the old benches. And I was like, this is majestic. It felt like a major league stadium to me because probably back in the 20s, it was one of the biggest stadiums out there. And we looked and we walked into the stadium and there was less than 300 people in the ballpark. And it was a minor league professional game. It was a Saturday night. Wow. So I actually kept texted the commissioner of the league and I said, if this team ever leaves, we're coming to Savannah. And so I fell in love with the idea of this opportunity to resurrect this old stadium and put life back in it. And lo and behold, the team couldn't draw fans and they wanted a new stadium. The city said no, they left and we came on in. Wow. So you just picked up, you moved and I'm sure there were some pretty big difficulties in the beginning. Could you just share a few of those? Like, what was it like, like right when you picked up? I mean, I'm sure you, you came into a team that to stage a turnaround obviously takes time. You know, what were some of the hardships that you had to go through in the early days? Well, we showed up that first day and everything was taken out of the stadium. There was no office. <laughs> the phone lines were cut. The internet lines were cut. I remember our president, who was only 24 years old, and we had three 22-year-olds, and it was my wife and I. And we got the keys and said, good luck, guys. We grabbed a picnic table from outside in the park brought it into our abandoned storage building that we started working at using our cell phones and tried to tell everyone in the city, we're here. And as soon as we started telling everyone we're here, they said, who are you? No one knew like <laughs> college summer baseball. We've had professional, who are you guys? Why are you playing at the stadium? I mean, it was crickets. Wow. We, we, we had so little interest that, I mean, in fact, we only sold one season ticket in the first two months. And one so, season ticket. Yes. I mean, it was bad. It was so bad that on January 15th, 2016, at 4.45 p.m., I remember exactly where I was. I was in a hotel room, standing next to my wife. We were getting ready to go to my college roommate's wedding. We got a call at that time, and one of our employees said, we just overdrafted our account. We're completely out of money. And it was that moment I said, wow, what are we going to do? And this gives you an idea of my wife. She says, we have to sell our house. And so we sold our house, emptied out our savings account, and said, we need to go all in and making this work. Looking back on it, it was some of the best lessons that we learned during that period because we were just trying to be like everyone else. We were trying to fit in. John, I wasn't wearing the yellow tuxedo back then because I was too scared. I was too afraid to be different because we were just trying to fit in. And by trying to fit in, we were losing. You know, by trying to fit in, we didn't gain any customers. We didn't gain any fans. So what happened was we had to go the exact opposite. So finally, we had an aha moment sleeping on our airbed in Savannah and said, we got to go dramatically different. We got to name the team the Savannah Bananas. We got to come up with senior citizen dance teams called the Banana Bananas. Uh, we got to name our mascot Split. We got to make every ticket all inclusive. I mean, we thought everything. What can we do 
to be dramatically different, to create a tension just so we can serve. Jeez. So, and I really want to stress this to the audience because I know that the people listening, if they have not, you know, looked you up, they don't realize just how incredible of an accomplishment what you've been able to do is. So you, you took over a team that sold one season ticket. Now, how many seats are there at that stadium? Well, we were actually an expansion franchise. So the minor league team left, we were a brand new team at mm. college summer baseball. And so the, the stadium is over 4,000 seats. And so in those first six months, we had zero sales. I mean, we had a couple tickets that we sold total. And so then we had to come out with an attention plan to, not a marketing plan, an attention plan to be able to start creating buzz and excitement. And that's really what we started doing once we named the team the Bananas. Wow. And so, and now you're, I mean, you sell out every game and you have a waiting list for like, is it years or is it just <laughs> that, like thousands of people waiting? I like the waiting list for years. Sounds amazing. Uh, <laughs> no, we, we, uh, yes, we have a waiting list till 2037 right now. So good luck. <laughs> um, we have a, uh, we've sold out every single game and we have a wait list in the thousands. So if you want to get a box seat or if you want to try to get the stadium club seat, you're going to be on the list for a little bit. And we're working on that. We're trying to add more seats. That's our goal. But yeah, it's, we pinch ourselves. It's unprecedented. It's never happened at this level. Uh, and even in minor league sports and, and professional sports, it's very rare. And uh, we're very lucky because we've created something that's unique. And I think it's a huge tribute to not only our team, but the fans. I mean, our fans come dressed in banana costumes. They have tattoos. They have like, one guy shapes his beard like a banana. I mean, they, they get they get our logo in their head, like in their hairstyles. I mean, our fans are just unbelievable for a college summer baseball team. And we're just so lucky that they've built this community into what it is. We're just the ones that are guiding and you know helping put on the show. Wow. And so this is just so fascinating to me because of just how incredible this accomplishment is. You know, a lot of the people and the premise of this show is really it's like a keynote speech, right? Like if you were giving a keynote, what would be some of the biggest takeaways? And your, your story in and of itself is the takeaways, you know, just how you did it, what you did. And so I'm just really fascinated because when I listened to your, you were a guest on Mike Dillard's podcast and you said something that I literally stopped the podcast and I started taking notes. And before I even listened a minute past that podcast, I took what you said and I thought of a million ways that I could apply it to what I was doing. You said something that I just, I really want to have you touch on. You said, you know, everybody's trying to be better. How can I be better? But you need to be thinking about how can I be different? How can I be the only? And, and I quote, and that was like the aha moment for me. It's just like, how can I be the only daycare center? How can I be the only? And I just want to have you share, like, how did you come up with that statement? And, and what does that mean? And how did, what are some of the things that you're doing right now? You know, you've, you've touched on a few of them, like with the grandparents and the beer, but I just want to, you know, have you just share a few more of those to give people, get them brainstorming on what they can do for their own businesses. Sure. And I've actually done keynotes on the concept of the only, so I can share a little bit of framework on that. Um, based the acronym of only. And so to create, to be the only in your industry, you need to first with the O, own the problems in your industry. So what that means is look at what are the things that people hate about your industry? What are the things that people are get frustrated by in your industry? And you need to own it and embrace it. So to give you an example, the baseball industry, there are some serious problems. Attendance is declining dramatically. One of the biggest problems is that it's too long, too slow, and too boring. So we had to own that and say, all right, what would be the opposite of that? Fast, exciting, nonstop entertainment. That's why our players dance. That's why we have a break dancing first base coach. That's why we have a male cheerleading team <laughs> that's known as the dad bod cheerleading squad. All right. So that's one thing. Other problems in the industry, every sporting event, every concert you've been to, they're, what are they known for? It's almost nickel and diming. That's right. You, bucks for this, six bucks for this, 10 bucks for this. It's almost just a rite of passage. You go to a sporting event, you're going to walk out with a lot less money. And so, all right, that's a problem. So owning the problems, why don't we do the exact opposite? Which would, there would, would be, let's make all inclusive. Every ticket, include all your burgers, your hot dogs, your chicken sandwich, your soda, your water, your popcorn, your dessert. And we did it when we first started at $15, including your ticket. All inclusive for $15. Yep. Includes your ticket, includes everything and not, and we don't cut it off. Most teams, like they do like a short little, no, as soon as you walk in at 5.30, if you leave at 10 o'clock, you can still get two more burgers. Wow. So, so own the problems. 
So what are the problems in, you know, in the daycare industry, the real estate, what are those problems? What are those things that people hate? And when you do that, you can do the opposite of that. So that's the O. And I don't know, John, if you want me to keep going. I can yes, sir. Absolutely. Then the N is create noise. Attention beats marketing 1,000% of the time. So every, t- every company in, in the world has a marketing plan. Most companies have a, a marketing director or a marketing coordinator. But how many people actually have an attention plan or someone that's set on creating attention? And so we've built our business by different things that create attention. So for instance, when we announced the team of Savannah Bananas, that was strategic. When we announced the mascot, named them Split, that was strategic. When President Obama's term as president was over, we offered him an internship with the Savannah Bananas. <laughs> We've yet to hear from him. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I was just going to ask that. Point, that, was, that was about creating attention. Two years ago, when we launched Dolce and Banana Underwear, we're the only team in the country that sells underwear. We have a big banana on the crotch on one size and then a small banana on the crotch on the other. All right. The, the big banana outsells the small banana dramatically. It's not even close. But the reality is that's how he thinks. When we announced our male cheerleading team, that was about attention. I don't know when this releases, but we're going to be announcing a banana nana calendar with our <laughs> banana nanas. Like that will come in November, December. That will be to create attention. So every month, what is your business doing to create attention? Because here's the thing. If you market like everyone else, you're going to get results like everyone else. That's right. But if you create attention, you'll have people, your customers, your fans, your employees, they'll be telling everyone else. And the best marketing in the world is, is it shareable? So how are you creating noise? And again, that's, that's number two. And I can quickly go through the last two if you'd like. Well, before you get into the last two, which I, you, you don't have to do it quickly. Okay. So good. But I just want to ask, these ideas, are these all your ideas? Or do you have like other people contributing? Like, because these are fantastic ideas. Like, where are you getting all of these ideas? You know, John, that's the number one question I get asked all the time. <laughs> how do you come up with ideas? You know, again, that's actually a really good point. If you're getting asked a question a lot, then you should think about that. Your people want to know that. So what are you doing? So like, I, I may just have to write a book on how to get kind of up with That's ideas. Right. Because we, we've been able to build a culture that ideas are valued as currency. And so when you look at that, I've said before, ideas are currency, but it's implementation that will make you rich. We have mm-hmm. more currency in the world with ideas, but a lot of times it's not until we implement that we really start seeing how it all comes to play. So how do we do that? I think it starts personally. You need to work your idea muscle. I learned this from James Altucher. I write down 10 ideas every single morning and I don't miss a morning. And wow. John, most of the ideas are terrible. <laughs> I mean, they are crap, but there's usually maybe one or two good ones every week that, that, that we can work with. I start with the framework of whatever's normal, do the exact opposite. So I write down what are all the normal things that happen at a baseball game? What would be the exact opposite? That's a framework I use. Then we have idea paloozas here where we have an idea box where people on our team throw ideas in. And then we get together and say, all right, what are those ideas that we can put into play that we can implement? And so we start building that. And one of our core beliefs is different. And so if we want to be different, we have to have ideas to be different. So it's just part of our culture. And so during these idea paloozas, we'll have fun, we'll have food, we'll have drinks, and we'll just talk about what can we do. But it's not just the ideas. It's also the permission from the top to try those ideas. Right. I mean, some things don't work as well. I mean, they just don't. I mean, we've done a lot of things that are just flat out weird. But again, I think that's just part of of who we are. And I think, you know, everyone asks, like, what are your biggest failures? What are those things that don't work? We don't think like, because we're on to the next idea. It's constantly what's next, what's next, what's next. And the way our phones, we have a hold music that it's like literally a hold music. Ring, 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 banana phone. Like we, we try to think of everything. Like our voicemail, we have a singer that says, Savannah, na, na, na. You've reached the Savannah Bananas, na, na, na. And we play with the songs. So what are all those normal touch points that you can have? And what would be dramatically different? And so we've trained our minds to think that. That's incredible. I'm excited to hear what the L and the Y are now. <laughs> L and Y gets more serious. So the first two are wacky and crazy. The, the, the L and the Y is you got to love your customers more than you love your product. If you want to be the only in your industry, you got to follow where your customers are going, not where you want to go with your product. you got to be in love with who you serve, not with what you sell. So what I mean by that is the name of our company is Fans First Entertainment. So we're constantly thinking, what would be that most magical, amazing fan experience from the first time they interact with us to when they leave? And very few companies, I think, you know, there's a small percentage of companies that map the experience, but how much do they put in the detail of that? 
you know, what happens when someone buys from you? You know, we send a video, which is over the top. You know, it's like, congrats, you just made the best decision in your day. Right now, as your ticket order came in, our Bananiacs went into the ticket laboratory as a high priority siren went off. Then they were trying to get your tickets as a banana nana slowly walked in and hand picked your tickets and placed them on a silk pillow. We now raise the pillow into the air as our Bananiacs celebrated the birth of a new fan by singing Circle of Life. Na Savania. Then we brought your tickets to our vault where they're now in maximum security, ready for you to go bananas. So that is what happens the first time someone buys a ticket. And so again, we think about that experience as they go through. And I think it's not because we love our products, because we love our customers so much and they deserve a fun, unique, entertaining experience from the first time they interact until when they leave. So love your customers more than you love your product. Wow. Got it. Step four. <laughs> Final one here is, is the why. And I know you're probably very familiar with this, Simon Sinek. It's not what you do. It's not how you do it. It's why you do it. That's right. And the first time I watched his Start With Why video, it changed, it changed my life. And it really inspired me to think, you know, hey, we don't just give away porta johns and colon cleansings, like which we do in our games. It's not just <laughs> to do that for fun. There's a bigger purpose into why we do what we do. And, you know, it's, it's taken some people on our staff to really share. I mean, I would never forget when a gentleman came up to me after a game, big guy with a mustache, gave me a huge hug. And he said, thank you. And I go, oh, I appreciate that, Todd. But why? And he goes, no, thank you. He goes, my mother and I haven't talked for years, but she came out to a game and watched the players dance and watched all the fun and had the time of her life. Mm -hmm. My mother and I now sit together at every single game. You've brought the relationship back together for my mother and I. And it's moments like that, that we realize that there's a bigger purpose to all the craziness, the zaniness, the fun, that we're bringing people together and hopefully caring for them like family. And that's what drives me as an only child who's always been, you know, trying to feel connected to a family. And I think that's what drives our entire organization. The why I'm finishing with, because I, but I, I know we start with why I'm finishing with, because it makes you understand all the zaniness, all the craziness. That's why we do it. I love that. And I am a huge fan. That's one of three books that has really changed my life. Start with why the four hour work week, but you know, I've been a huge Simon Sinek fan. So I want to transition just a little bit because now I don't know if you do or not. Like, do you do any consulting for like business owners or are you just strictly baseball right now? No, that's, that's where we've really uh, started working a lot on over the last year. So we do workshops at our stadium called Fans First You. And then I do speaking mm -hmm. as well about the customer experience and the employee experience. So yeah, we've, we get a lot of purpose out of now sharing this and hopefully seeing companies share it as well. Oh man, I cannot wait the end of this podcast to let everybody know where they can find you. And because I know I am super excited, just your philosophy in general is just, it's so powerful and it's so needed today because it seems like so many businesses are just scared to death to have a little bit of fun or to be a little bit different. Like, you know, the only thing I can think of recently, I don't know if you've seen is this chicken sandwich war between Chick-fil-A and Popeye's. Have you seen this going on? Yeah. Again, I don't even, like really pay attention much to the news, yeah. but it's been riveting because I love how they're having fun with it. Absolutely. So I want to just transition before we wrap up into like, you know, outside of baseball for just a minute, because, you know, most of the audience listening to this are just, they're entrepreneurs. And, you know, like myself, you know, we're always looking at ways that we can be different. And it's so great to just have perspective of somebody else. And so I just, I wanted to take you through a really quick scenario you know, because I just, I love the way that you look at things. And I feel that no matter what industry you were to go in, you'd crush it. And so I just want to throw a random industry out there. I just want to pretend that let's just using your only acronym, let's pretend that you became a real estate agent today, knowing what, you know, what little or as much as you know about real estate, you know, take us through how you might do things a little bit differently. If you were a realtor, you just got your license today. And I just want to have you take us through that if you don't mind. <laughs> well, you start with, uh, again, what are the problems from realtors? What are the challenges? And as someone who's had to sell some houses and, and buy houses, I think there's a lack of sometimes personal connection. I think it is, hey, we're just another person buying a house, selling a house. It's just right. another transaction. So I think you got to look at what are those problems with that process? What are the problems you know, when you reach out to someone? And you know, I'd go through the entire process. So what are those steps? You know, what's normal? What's the normal process? When they sell a house, for instance, is it, hey, we have an open house, we put out a sign in the yard, 
and that's it. I recently saw a sign and I took a picture of it because it said free pizza when you buy a house. So they had it on the side, it said free pizza when you buy this house. And I thought about that for a while and I, I was like, that is so brilliant. What, as a realtor, what are you known for? What makes you different? And so this goes into the own and the problems as well. You know, everyone just tries to differentiate. I've sold this many houses. I guarantee I'll sell your house. I do. You're talking about your product, how good you are. Why right. don't you talk about something that you offer and deliver and serve, like pizza. You're known as, hey, always I have pizza parties at every house that I, that I have. You know, I'm known as candy. I have live music. I have a guitarist at every open house. You know, whatever it is, I don't know. But go the opposite of that route. And how do you create noise? I think gift giving with realtors is mm -hmm. lacking. I think as someone who's now, I think we've been through three houses, we got one bottle of champagne, which my wife and I don't drink champagne. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that didn't make an impact on us. But like, think about this. If someone's selling their house, they've lived there for a while. What if you had a painting, a mural painting done of their house that they lived in? Okay. Mm. What if they're buying a new house? Could you get like a painting or a picture of street signs of their old house with the year that lived there and then the new street sign of their house they're living in now. So it could be like 114 McDonald Way and now it's 112 Cole Way or wherever it is that they're living now. You know, just think of those. The realtors get to go in people's houses. They get to know so many personal things about their clients, which 99% of businesses, people don't get to know. If you listen wow. carefully and respond creatively, that's how you can win. And I learned that from Darren Ross, the CEO of Magic Castle Hotel. You know, think about this. Listen carefully, respond creatively. He's taught his people at a hotel, which is the number two rated hotel in LA, that find out why they're here in LA. And for instance, if someone says, oh, we're big Marilyn Monroe fans, we're going to see her, her star and check out some of her things in the museum. They heard that, one person heard that and went and got a Marilyn Monroe poster, put it in the hotel room before they got back and signed it for Marilyn, said, thanks for coming to check out me. You know, we love Marilyn. Wow. Listen carefully, respond creatively. So, you know, I know I went around that a little bit, but I think that fundamental question for a realtor, what do you want to be known for? And if it's about how many houses you sell, I think you're going the wrong direction. What do you want to be known for on how you make people feel? So that's, that's kind of a framework that I would use. And I'd have to, I'd have to think about it because I haven't been in that industry. <laughs> oh man, yeah. you, you answered that perfectly. It was genius. Like any realtor that listens to this is going to start buying paintings that's just so creative. It's just incredible that you said that. My, my girlfriend is a realtor. And so oh. I'm going to have her listen to this tonight. And I just, I already know the look on her face. She's going to be like, oh my God. And it's so funny because they don't do champagne. They do, what are the coolers, uh, the really famous coolers that are, uh, I can't think of the name of it, but they do a Yeti lot of coolers. really, yes, yes, Yeti. Yes. They do these big Yeti coolers. But I just, I love I love the direction that you took. And so, you know, before we wrap up, I just wanted to, you know, ask you one last question, you know, just kind of what's next for you? Because obviously you've done some amazing things with baseball. Like, is there anything further that you can do with, with baseball other than trying to expand the seating? Are you trying to own another team or transform baseball in general? <laughs> I can tell you listen to the Mike Dillard podcast because I am adamant about the desire to change the game of baseball. That's not our why. But I think that's part of part of it. If we believe so much in fans first and bringing people together, there's still a fundamental problem with baseball. It's still too long. It's still not as fun for fans. It's still the traditional way of baseball. And yeah, I think a big picture game of us is to change the game and make it fun for more people. So yes, we have ideas. We've done tests. We've practiced. We've done some unique games. You know, the next big picture, other than teaching this fans first, which we're loving doing, I think is how do we take the show on the road, similar to the Globe Trotters, which we've been described as before, mm -hmm. and bring a whole new excitement of baseball where people don't leave in the middle of the game. The reality is, when was the last time, John, you went to a great movie or a great show or a comedy show? And you're like, oh, this is great. I love it. I'm going to leave now. It's halfway over. That's never. Yep. But every single baseball game, people leave in the middle because they've had enough. That's a problem. And if we're not trying to solve it and not trying to make it better, we're not doing our job and following where our customers are going. We are not loving our customers more than our product because our customers are showing us that they are leaving sometimes the games early. Even though at the end of our games, like John, at the end of our games, we have our pet band playing for 30 minutes. We have our <laughs> players signing autographs. We have a free s'more station. We have air dancer people that are dressed in these crazy <laughs> costumes dancing. It's a party. But only half our crowd gets to see it because everyone else is leaving early. 
So to answer your question, we're going to continue to go where our fans are going, and that will mean changing the game to make it even better for our fans. Wow. I sincerely hope that you do a lot more for businesses in the future too, because I just, I know they need it. And I know that this episode is going to be so helpful for so many people just to expand their thinking. And man, Jesse, I just, I want to thank you for being a guest on this show today. It was such a great, I mean, lots of laughs, but more importantly than that, it's just the learning was incredible, man. I I just want to thank you for your time. Thank you so much. I'll tell you, uh, you've been hungry and reaching out and I'm really excited to see your journey, where you're going with everything that you're doing. And, you know, I think, you know, we say it simply on our website, we, we make baseball fun. I think all businesses can be made more fun. And I can tell just by your energy that you're open to it, you're excited about it, and uh, it's going to be fun to see what happens. Absolutely. Finally, where can the people listening connect with you? What's the best way to follow you? You have a book out as well that I really think people need to pick up because if it's even a tenth of what we covered today, like they need this book. So where, where can people find your book? How can they connect with you and things like that? Good. And I hope it's a little bit more than a tenth of what we covered because that would be a really short book if I, <laughs> but uh, this, if you search, this is, if you search yellow tux, you will find me. It's as simple as that. What are you known for? For me, it's the yellow tux. I post every day, LinkedIn. I have my website, find your yellow tux. But yeah, just reach out. Is there any way I can help? Just like you. It was exciting to see how hungry you were and what you're trying to do to make a difference in reach out. I'll write back and see how we can connect. Awesome. Grateful for your time. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. All right, everyone. Thank you for tuning in today. And I hope you were as educated and entertained as I was after interviewing Jesse. If you get a chance, definitely connect with Jesse on Instagram at yellow tux Jesse, or you could just do what I do and just head over to YouTube and watch some of their videos of baseball games. I go to YouTube and I just type in Savannah Bananas and those videos are absolutely fun, entertaining, but just pure marketing gold. Jesse is a true showman just like P.T. Barnum or Walt Disney and the videos are just amazing when it comes to ideas for clever marketing. One last thing, please follow us on Instagram. You can find us at Mentor Nation Podcast. Again, that is at Mentor Nation Podcast and our YouTube channel will be up and running soon as well as our Facebook page. We will see you next week with another really powerful episode. Have an amazing day.